In video 3 of PMFIS environment video series, we will be dealing with chapter 4 of PMFIS environment book. The chapter 4 is functions of an ecosystem where we have two important concepts, ecological succession and homeostasis in an ecosystem. Coming to the basics, in the previous videos we have seen what environment and ecosystem are. Environment is the natural component in which biotic and abiotic components interact among themselves and with each other. So we have three kinds of interactions taking place in an environment. The ecosystem is very similar except that in an ecosystem the biotic components play a major part. So here the interactions are either between two biotic components or between a biotic and a abiotic component. In simple words, the interactions are between organisms or between or organisms and the environment. And all these interactions which are taking place in an ecosystem, the study of which is what we term as ecology. Based on various interactions that are taking place in an ecosystem, there are various functions performed by the ecosystem. These can be divided into ecological succession or ecosystem development, where one community of species in an area is replaced by a more advanced community of species until a climax community is reached. And then we have homeostasis which is the propensity of the ecosystem to maintain a state of equilibrium. Then we have tropic levels or energy flow through the food chain. For example, here we have the primary producer which is providing food to the primary consumer and the primary consumer becomes prey to the secondary consumer and this process goes on. This is what we call as tropic levels or energy flow through a food chain. And then we have nutrient cycling or biogeochemical cycles where a nutrient is recycled in the ecosystem. For example, here we have carbon dioxide which is being absorbed by the plant and in the, in the process of photosynthesis it is going to produce starch or carbohydrates which are consumed by the primary consumer and during respiration the primary consumer gives out carbon dioxide. This is the process in which the carbon is being recycled in the ecosystem. Likewise there are various other nutrients which are being recycled in the ecosystem and all those we will be studying in the future videos under nutrient cycling or biogeochemical cycling. Coming to the first topic of the chapter, ecological succession. Ecological succession is a process by which a community of species in an area are replaced by a more advanced community of species over a period of time. There are various stages that are involved in ecological succession. The initial stage is dominated by pioneer communities. Pioneer communities consist of plant communities which are the first to colonize an area. And the plant communities would be replaced by a more advanced community and this process goes on until a climax community is reached. The climax community is the one which is stable and mature and doesn't facilitate the formation of a new community in the area. Each of the successional stages that take place in an ecological succession are what we called as series or successional stages. And each of the transitional community is what we call as Cyril community. There are two types of ecological succession. One is primary succession and the other is secondary succession. Let us understand various stages of ecological succession with the help of primary succession. Primary succession begins over a land area where no prior community of species has ever existed. These landforms might include rock outcrops, newly formed deltas, volcanic landforms and a new landform formed after a landslide and any other area where no prior community of species has ever existed. Under the right climatic conditions, these landforms would be colonized by various primitive organisms such as mosses, lichens and other microbes. These microbes over their lifetime would secrete organic acids which would dissolve the substratum or the top layer of the landform giving rise to primitive soils. These primitive soils would be occupied by small annual plants and lichens and over a period of time the primitive soils would be enriched by various nutrients and the soil would be mature and would enable the development of a much more advanced community. This process continues where the pioneer species are replaced by an intermediate species which might be grasses, shrubs and various shade intolerant trees. Over a period of time, this process continues until a climax community is reached. The climax community is the one which does not facilitate or cannot be replaced by a further community. This is because 
the resources in the ecosystem are being optimally used by the climax community and for a more advanced community the resources are not adequate like we have seen in the primary succession there are various stages in an ecological succession it all begins with the pioneer species which advances to the intermediate species and then finally we have a climax community each of these stages are called as successional stages or series and each of these transitional communities are called as serial community let us now understand what is secondary succession secondary succession is very similar to primary succession except that here the succession begins with the end of a community of the primary succession as we have seen that there are various stages in primary succession like pioneer species the one occupied by intermediate species or the climax species if any one of these communities are destroyed due to various biotic or abiotic factors then after a period of time a new community would get developed this is where the secondary succession begins like in the primary succession here also we have pioneer species which make way for intermediate species and then finally we have a climax community let us now understand what are the differences between primary and secondary succession in primary succession everything begins in a landform where no prior community has ever existed whereas in secondary succession the succession begins where a community of a primary succession has ended since it takes a long time for soil to develop in primary succession here each successional stage or series is quite long as a result the succession here takes hundreds of years whereas in secondary succession the succession begins on already well developed soils as a result each series is of very short duration as a result in secondary succession the overall succession is relatively faster compared to the primary succession moving to the next concept autogenic succession and allogenic succession autogenic succession is a succession driven by biotic components in an ecosystem biotic components would involve any primitive species to the most advanced form of life forms whereas in allogenic succession the succession is driven by abiotic components like fire flood or any other abiotic factor for example here in primary succession the succession begins on a bare land mass so the bare land mass is an abiotic component and under the influence of moisture lichens grow on this bare land mass so here we can say that the abiotic components moisture and land mass are leading to the succession hence here this succession is what we call as allogenic succession likewise in the secondary succession we have the end of a community due to abiotic components like fire so here the succession we call it as again allogenic succession likewise at various stages both biotic and abiotic factors play important role in bringing about the succession process coming to the next topic succession in plants and water succession that begins in dry conditions is called as xerarch succession that occurs under wet conditions is called as hydrarch irrespective of whether succession begins in dry conditions or wet conditions it leads to an intermediate state which is called as mesic mesic is the state where the conditions are neither dry nor wet let us understand this with the help of succession in water here the pioneer species are phytoplankton and then small plant species and then we have free floating algae and various other floating primitive plant like species and this community of species is replaced by a swamp and the swamp over a period of time gets accumulated with sediments and organic matter and gives rise to a mesic state which is neither dry nor wet and finally we have a climax community which is a forest so we can say that irrespective of whether the ecological succession begins under dry conditions or wet conditions the climax community is always a forest let us now move on to the next important topic of the chapter homeostasis in an ecosystem so what exactly is homeostasis homeostasis is the propensity or the natural ability of the system to maintain a state of equilibrium for example in organisms there are various mechanisms through which an organism is capable of maintaining homeostasis or a state of equilibrium such examples include or mechanisms include thermoregulation osmoregulation migration activity suppression etc let us understand each of these in detail so what exactly is thermoregulation let us see the example of warm blooded animals for example birds and mammals are warm blooded animals they are also called as endotherms 
Endotherms are the ones which are capable of maintaining a constant body temperature irrespective of the conditions in the surrounding environment. So we can say that the warm blooded animals are capable of thermoregulation. On the other hand, we have cold blooded animals like fishes, reptiles and amphibians which are not capable of maintaining a constant body temperature. Their body temperature depends on the temperature of the ambient surroundings. So we can say that these animals like fishes, reptiles and amphibians are not capable of thermoregulation. So those animals which are capable of thermoregulation are called as regulators and those animals which are not capable of thermoregulation are called as conformers. Likewise, we have another mechanism called as osmoregulation. Osmoregulation is a process by which an organism is able to maintain an optimum level of osmotic pressure, thereby having a good balance of fluid and salt content in its body. To understand this, we need to know what osmosis is. Let us understand what osmosis is. For that, we need to know what is solution. A solution is the one in which there is a solvent which dissolves a solute. For example, if we add glucose to water, then water is the solvent and the glucose is the solute. And osmosis is the process in which a solute moves from a region of higher concentration to a region of lower concentration when they are separated by a semi-permeable membrane. Let us understand this with the example. Here in the beaker, the right part and the left part are separated by a semi-permeable membrane. In the right part, the concentration of the solute is higher, whereas on the left part, it is lower. After some time, the solute moves from a region of higher concentration to a region of lower concentration and the water moves, moves in the opposite direction across the semi-permeable membrane. This natural mechanism is what we call as osmosis. So the mechanism of osmosis will help us understand what osmotic pressure means. Here in the example, we have the left part and the right part separated by a semi-permeable membrane. In both the parts, we have water, which is a solvent. Let us add some glucose to one part, that is the left part. And now the, the concentration of glucose is higher in the left part and it is lower in the right part. So it is the natural property where osmosis occurs that is glucose moves from a region of higher concentration to a region of lower concentration. So naturally here the glucose must move from left to right through the semi-permeable membrane and the water must move in the opposite direction. But this can be prevented by a mechanism where we apply certain degree of pressure on the right part. So by applying this pressure, the osmosis is prevented and the minimum pressure which is required to prevent the solute from moving from one section to the other is what we call as osmotic pressure. So here we can see that when there is no osmotic pressure applied, we have osmosis where the solute moves from an area of higher concentration to the area of lower concentration. On the other hand, when there is osmotic pressure applied, for example, here we are applying a certain degree of uh, osmotic pressure and no solute moves in this direction. So this is what osmotic pressure means. So why did we study about osmotic pressure? We have seen that osmoregulation is a process in which an organism is able to maintain an optimum level of osmotic pressure, fluid content and ionic concentration. Let us understand this with the help of a fish. Here we have freshwater fish and saltwater fish. When a freshwater fish moves from an area of fresh water to an area of salt water, then the salts enter the fish's body through the process of osmosis or diffusion. Hence, we can say that the solute has moved from an area of higher concentration to the area of lower concentration. Here we can say that the fish is not able to maintain a constant osmotic pressure because its fluid content and salt content is changing based on the environment in which it lives. The same way in the oceanic fish or marine fish, when they move into fresh water, the salts come out of the fish due to osmosis. So we can say that fishes are the ones which are not capable of osmoregulation or they are not capable of maintaining a constant or optimum osmotic pressure. On the other hand, we have humans, irrespective of whether humans swim in river water or ocean water, the osmotic pressure or ionic balance in their body doesn't change. They still have the same fluid content as well as the salt content in their body. So we can say that humans are capable of osmotic regulation or 
osmo regulation whereas fishes are incapable of such a process fishes are conformers whereas mammals are regulators in terms of osmo regulation similar to thermo regulation and osmo regulation there are various other ways through which an organism tries to attain a state of equilibrium or homeostasis in terms of its bodily functions for example we have migration which is a mechanism which is helpful in maintaining homeostasis in an organism for example we humans tend to move away from sunny areas in the summer afternoons and we move into shade zones like under a tree or under a roof in order to prevent excess loss of bodily fluids in the form of sweat so here we can say that with the help of migration we are able to maintain an appropriate osmotic pressure or the concentration of bodily fluids and salts likewise there are various other mechanisms here we have activity suppression and suspended development hibernation and aestivation are examples for activity suppression whereas diapause is an example for suspended development let us understand each of these in detail in the polar regions during the harsh winter months animals such as polar bears use a technique called as hibernation to overcome both food shortages as well as the harsh climatic conditions in hibernation the polar bears reduce their metabolic rate to an extent that they can live without food for months together they just find a suitable place where they can go into dormancy for months and come out of hibernation when when the conditions are right likewise in the tropics when the conditions are very hot certain animals like snails earthworms go into a condition called as aestivation similar to hibernation even in aestivation there is suppression in metabolic rate here the organisms try to prevent loss of moisture through their skin surface using techniques such as twisting themselves into a tight knot so that they offer less surface area for the dry conditions which would cause desiccation in their body surfaces on the other hand we have diapause which is an example for suspended development this is observed in phytoplankton in lakes and various other bodies where due to stressful conditions the phytoplankton stop their growth to overcome the challenges posed by the environment so this is what we call as diapause or a state of suspended development let us now move on to the main concept homeostasis in ecosystems it is the ability of the ecosystem to self regulate we have seen that every system on earth tries to maintain a state of equilibrium similarly even the ecosystem tries to maintain a state of equilibrium or homeostasis and this is achieved by various mechanisms the most important of them is negative feedback mechanism so let us understand what negative feedback and positive feedback mechanism are let us take an example of air conditioning to understand what positive feedback mechanism is during hot summer months we tend to switch on our cooling appliances as a result energy consumption goes up when the energy consumption goes up the power production also goes up since most of the power production comes from coal the co2 emissions goes up as a result since co2 is a greenhouse gas its levels in the atmosphere increase and the temperatures also rise since there is an increase in temperature more power is consumed in the form of cooling applications and again more power is produced and this cycle repeats here we can see that an increase in one factor is leading to an increase in another factor so this is what we call as a positive feedback mechanism let us understand negative feedback mechanism with the help of prey predator relationship when the population of the prey is high the population of the predator is also high so this is an example for a positive feedback and when the population of the predator is high the population of the prey comes down this is an example for a negative feedback and when the population of prey is down the population of predator is also down this is an example for a positive feedback where a decrease in one factor is causing a decrease in the other factor and when the predator population is low the population of the prey increases this is an example for a negative feedback here we can see that the self regulatory mechanism is in the form of positive feedback and negative feedback mechanisms so these are the kind of interactions which shape the homeostasis in an ecosystem the ecosystem to a great extent is able to self regulate through these feedback mechanisms however the homostatic capacity 
or the ability of the ecosystem to maintain a state of equilibrium is not unlimited. This is because if there is a major biotic or abiotic factor which is causing a bigger disturbance in the ecosystem, then the ecosystem might not be able to self-regulate and the ecosystem would collapse as a result.